Okay, so let's move on to part two, big history research section. And first speaker is Nobuo Tsujimura from Institute for Global and Cosmic Peace. And the title is A Forgotten Big Historian, Saburo Kitagawa and His Vision of Synthetic Natural History. Nobuo, can you proceed? Thank you very much for coming here to see us today. I'm Nobuo Tsujimura from the Institute for Global and Cosmic Peace in Yokohama, Japan. Today, I'll talk about a forgotten big historian, Saburo Kitagawa and his vision of synthetic natural history. This year, probably many people thought about a problem of war and peace. And what I want to remind you here is that a longing for peace is one of the most important starting points of big history. H.G. Wells got determined to write a history of humanity, not nations, after, experience, after experiencing the World War II, World War I, he writes, there can be no common peace and prosperity without common historical ideas. Likewise, my mentor, Osamu Nakanishi, sought for universal history for peace, not to repeat a tragedy like WW Second. The Cuban Missile Crisis made realize young David Christian living in the United Kingdom at the time and Jacob Nazareth in Russia that the need of overcoming tribalism and parochialism. And during the Vietnam War, Barry Rodrigue realized it was wrong. So for all of these big historians, war became an important starting point going toward big history. And there was another man who shared Wells' idea in Japan. He was Saburo Kitagawa. He was born in the end of the 19th century, 19th century, and graduated from the first high school and Tokyo Imperial University. He was not from an upper class, but that's a super elite course at that time. He was very good at multiple languages including Esperant. And after graduation from the university, he became professor at Tokyo Higher School. His greatest achievement was translation of the outline of history written by Wells. And right after completing it, he committed to a love suicide with his Fiance Yoneko in the sea of trees around Mount Fuji in a heavily snowy winter. Journalist Masami Inagaki investigated this tragedy and concluded that Kitagawa's elder brothers and sisters opposed his marriage because Yoneko and her family didn't have good or enough social status, and that Kitagawa maybe chose perfection of love in another world by death, rather than imperfect success of marriage in this world. Anyway, there are some points he attracts me, but uh, I cannot tell everything today. But one important thing is that his eldest brother, Nobuhiko, became the head of Nagasaki shipyard of Mitsubishi heavy industries where my grandfather worked until his retirement. Yet what matters most to us is that he was practitioner of big history. According to journalist Inagaki's interviews, his students remember. Hitagawa was loved by many students 
and they were impressed by his lecture that covered a very wide range of knowledge from formation of the cosmos to the origin and evolution of life and history of humankind. That is big history, isn't it? But he was almost forgotten. Probably most of all Japanese don't know about him, but I, I found him. So I believe that there are much similar pioneers of big history around the world. And they are now slept in the documents written in different languages. Some of you can read, but others cannot read. Yet in this English dominant academia, sometimes information that was not written in English is treated as if it it did not exist. So I thought it would be my mission to salvage him and to connect the people living a century ago and the people living a century later from now on, from now, by doing that. Moreover, I'm determined to record all of your names, including today's presenters and those who has devoted and will devote themselves to big history and the history of big history in Asia and the world. So we are now making a history. Next, Kitagawa left his vision in his article, A Dream of Synthetic Natural History, that was included only in the Japanese deluxe edition of the outline of history. The image on the left, left side is that edition. But before showing his vision, I want to show you this iconic picture. This was shown by David Christian on the same day eight years ago at the IBHA conference. So this Van Gogh's painting is a symbol of what we are doing. We try to understand our place in the universe in, the integrated, in, a, in an integrative way. Kitagawa envisioned a similar thing under the name of synthetic natural history. He likens our life to a train journey. A scenery was seen from a window is an appearance of nature. We can know our speed, progress, direction, course, and consequences by integrating sceneries we see from the window. And there are different levels of or different phases of change in nature. Political history is like power, power poles flying in our eyesight. Economic history is like fields running. Cultural history is bridges walking. Anthropological history is hills striding. Biological history is like mountains moving. Geological history is like almost unmoved Mount Fuji, and cosmic history is like unmoved Polaris. So, synthetic natural history is integrated understanding and recording such various sceneries in a cosmic journey. Moreover, Kitagawa argues that. We need 20 of synthetic natural science. Synthetic natural history integrates temporal and concrete phenomena, while synthetic natural physics tries to grasp more abstract or theoretical things that can be applied to many different things. Mathematical logic gives us principle of differential and integral calculus. We already have done much things on differentiation, that is, 
we find so many facts and parts, but they still remain separated and look too fragmented. So all we need is integral calculus, Kitagawa says. In this way, synthetic natural physics and mathematical logic enable synthesis that is needed for synthetic natural history. In his view, a field that especially lacks such synthesis is human sciences. So we, we need intensive efforts to integrate the studies of humans from psychology, life, and biological sciences and physical and chemical sciences to anthropology, race studies, archaeology, geography, sociology, economics, linguistics, and so on. I just said race studies. So as many of his contemporaries living at the time, he had also prejudice and bias on indigenous and colonized people around the world. That's his limit, but I myself might be seen discriminative to some extent seen from the future. Next, after Kitagawa's passing, his friends Takeshi Shinohara and others inherited Kitagawa's wealth and formed Synthetic Science Society. And they co-translated the science of life and introduced the Vienna Circles concept, conception and articles on unified science. They also published the journal Synthetic Science and their anthology. But finally, they supported Japan's invasion and war that's totally against the idea of H.G. Wells and uh, probably of Saburo Kitagawa. Lastly, here's a reflection. Wells believed that the future big historians would make much better jobs than him. So have we made a new outline to satisfy Wells? If not, can we make it in the coming few years? Thank you for attention. Okay, so let's move on to the next talk uh, by Mr. Kenji Ichikawa from Areseya Shonan High School. The title is A Little Big History of Silicon. Kenji-san, are you ready? Okay. Okay. Uh, Matsuzaki-san, uh, can you, can you, uh, video? Okay. Yes, yes, your screen is on. Uh, okay, hi. Uh, my name is Kenji Ichikawa, uh, uh, the uh, world history teacher uh, of Areseya Shonan High School, uh, Chigasaki, Kanagawa, Japan. I am reporting on the little bit history of silicon. The purpose of this report is to investigate the role of silicon in human evolution. Silicon is the second most abundant element on the Earth's surface after oxygen with a clock number of 25.8, which indicates the percentage of elements present on the Earth's surface. Silicon is easily combined with oxygen and occurs as silicon dioxide crystals in the form of quartz silica sand and silica rock. Sand is small grains of quartz which are formed when rocks are broken up. The number one crack number is oxygen, but the most abundant element near the Earth's surface is actually silicon dioxide.
The elemental number of silicon is 14. Its symbol is SI. Silicon in its pure form is solid at room temperature, blue-gray in color, and has some metallic sheen. However, it is not a metal, but a hard, brittle, non-metallic crystal and a semiconductor with some electrical conductivity. Immediately above, above silicon on the period, periodic table of elements is carbon. Both have four bonding arms, and silicon crystals have exactly the same structure as diamonds, which are carbon crystals. Because silicon and carbon have so much in common, they are also called brother elements. However, the brothers have followed quite different fates. Both are easily combined with oxygen, the most abundant element on Earth with a Clark number of 49.5, resulting in silicon dioxide becoming stone and sand, and carbon dioxide becoming a gas. Carbon is the most important element in the world of life, and proteins and DNA are made mainly of carbon. It is not an exaggeration to say that living organisms are made of carbon. Silicon and carbon went their separate ways, with silicon becoming the king of the inorganic world and carbon the champion of the life world. Let us look at the subsequent progress of silicon and carbon. Silicon remains a stone and sand. Carbon, however, formed living organisms and eventually human appear. In this report, I will discuss the history of the co-evolution of silicon and human. I will focus on the history of the relationship between silicon and humans in three items, stone tools, lenses, and AI. The first human use of silicon was in stone tools. The best stones for stone tools are volcanic glass called obsidian and sedimentary rock called chart or flint, both of which are rich in silicon dioxide. As you can see from this table, the human brain had not grown in size for about 4.5 million years since its birth. The brain is an energy consuming organ and to maintain a large brain, it was necessary to eat meat, which provides nutrition efficiently. Hunting was necessary for meat eating and the stone tools were necessary for that purpose. It is important to note that humans did not begin to use stone tools after their brains grew larger, but rather their brains grew larger after they began to use stone tools. This figure summarizes the effects of Homo erectus use the hand axe. It shows that not only was the brain larger, but Homo erectus looked much the same as modern humans.
glass made by mixing multiple raw materials and heating them to induce chemical changes is not physical processing, but chemical treatment. Therefore, when glassware is excavated from an archaeological site, the site is evaluated as being at the level of civilization. An important aspect of modern glass was the invention of the telescope and microscope using lenses. Using telescopes and microscopes, humans succeeded in expanding their view of the world by allowing their brains to take in information about the universe, microorganisms, and other unknown worlds. It was during World War II that it, it became clear that pure silicon was a semiconductor. An AI made from semiconductor is not a tool, nor is it part of the human body. It can be called a silicon brain, operating independently from humans, and we store information in the silicon brain that we cannot process on our own. We are already living our lives surrounded by AI, and without it, modern civilization would not exist today. This is a table summarizing the history of the relationship between silicon and humans focusing on three points, prehistoric stone tools, modern lenses, and present AI. Humans succeeded in eating meat regularly by improving stone tools, and as a, as a result, they succeeded in enlarging their brains. This enlargement of the brain through the improvement of stone tools means that we have developed the hardware to store more information in the brain. Humans who incorporated stone tools as, a, as part of their bodies were born in Africa and expanded from Africa to the rest of the world. Humans are the only mammals that have been able to expand into the world on their own. Stone tools enabled humans to evolve biologically, but it is important to note that more than one million years has, have passed, which is plenty of time for biological evolution. Lenses made from glass were tools that aided the human eye, and the lenses served to allow the human brain to take in a lot of information or software. Using telescopes and microscopes, humans have been able to use their brains to take in information from the universe, microbial world, and other unknown worlds. And this has led to the establishment of modern science. The basic idea of modern science is anthropocentrism. Humans believe that they were at the top of the biological world and could dominate nature with the power of, of modern science. Then, the Industrial Revolution and the modern era. AI made from semiconductor is, is not a tool, nor is it a part of the human body. Since AI is not a living organism, it can rapidly expand, develop, and enhance itself, and it can store, process, and analyze large amount of information beyond human capabilities. 
Only four hundred years have passed from the establishment of modern science through the industrial re re revolution to the present day. This is a length of time that would not allow for biological evolution for humans. Silicon has changed its shape and form from stone tools to lenses to AI, enlarging the human brain, supplying knowledge and information to humans, and storing, processing, and analyzing information and knowledge that exceeded human capabilities. Because humans are the main users of stone tools and lenses, stone tools and lenses will never overcome humans. However, in the case of AI, it is independent from humans as a silicon brain and can multiply without limit. This is why it is predicted that a singularity will come in the future when AI will overcome humans. Silicon and humans have evolved together, and the silicon has finally become the brain and is catching up with and surpassing humans. That is now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for Nobuo and Kenji. And now we can accept your questions. Uh, for 10 minutes, but before going to the question for this part, I, I see that uh, in the chat box, people are having a quite active discussion, but uh, about the uh, part one and uh, about religion, big history and science stuff. But the one participant has actually sent me the direct message and it is not shown to everyone. So I quickly read her quest, uh, comments addressed to the first two speakers. Uh, about uh, it is not a matter of establishing which religious belief is dominantly practiced, but to establish how we are co-equal as humans. Maybe this will dispel violence and all the other concerns we are facing nowadays. That was a comment from one participant, and thank you for that. And uh, let's go on to the part two question. And I think uh, there are many comments about part two talk, but I can pick up one question from the audience um, for Nobuo. And ah, yes, from Tan Chi Kyung, what binds the three elements of synthetic science together? Um, thank you for your question, Tan Chi Kyung. Um, Saburo Kitagawa likens nature to um, wild horse, and he likens um, <laughs> synthetic, synthetic natural history to horse stack. And uh, what unites, binds all of them um, is, in my opinion, um, our will to understand and cope with our reality. That unites everything. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, there are several comments, and I think they are no, not a question, so that each speaker can read the comments. And I think there is one question to Ichikawa san. Hi, hi. Um, Okay, human is made of carbon. Do you see human will be transformed entirely into silicon-based living being one day? Okay, <laughs> it's a nice question. Uh, the major question regarding the future relationship between silicon brain and the human brain is how we view human life, spirit, and mind. Uh, is a human brain a machine like the silicon brain? Or are we animals like other mammals? 
or are we special being with advanced knowledge? In the end, we are faced with the eternal question. What is a human being? I have not yet reached a conclusion. I would like to continue my research. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So actually I got a direct message by the direct message. I got one more question to Kenji. And uh, <laughs> I sent it to the to you in the chat box. I see that Kenji listed the use of hands or walking at the top of his diagram as being a predecessor to other key human abilities. I concur, but uh, can he or others talk more about this? So he, basically he wants to know more about the diagram that you showed before. <laughs> or uh, he said, he or others can talk more about this. So if you, uh, any of you from the audience have any idea about the addition, you can also speak out. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I emphasize the uh, role of stone tools uh, in human brain enlargement because brain enlargement occurs rapidly after Homo erectus use the hand axe. In this report, I have discussed silicon as a protagonist and how silicon has evolved humans. But of course, Homo erectus reaches the hand axe, so it can be viewed as co-evolution. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any comments about this matter? Okay, sure. Any other questions for two speakers? You can also raise your hands or unmute yourself and speak your speak out your question. Okay, there's one. Uh, Alexis, can you speak out? Yes. Uh, I just want to follow up on CC's question, which I think is very interesting. Uh, first, I thank the two speakers for uh, their great presentation. But in relationship to uh, TC's question, I actually want to follow up on uh, maybe the group thinking about uh, Silicon Bay uh, evolution, uh, because what is our, what should be our will uh, if the next evolution takes us beyond just carbon based, but a mixture of carbon based, silicon based, or other technology that will significantly change the, what we define as human, or how would we accept or how would we think about a situation that is beyond just human being the apex of this uh, system uh, right now, but other, uh, other organism or other structure being the, uh, I would say the more uh, dominant uh, uh, organism. So how, how should we, look at that. That's my question. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So it was, I think it was a question for uh, Ichikawa-san. Yes. Uh, 
on the I think that the uh, human is a machine or animal or special being. And uh, I have not, not yet uh, reached a conclusion. <laughs> and I would like to continue my research. And hi. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have any comments about that? Okay, if you, there are no other questions. Okay, so let's conclude the part two. And uh, thank you again for Ichikawa-san and Jimura-san. And let's have a short break, uh, about 10 minutes break. So now here uh, in Japanese standard time is 10.40 at night. So let's gather 10 minutes later, 10.50. My Japanese time and I don't know sorry but please uh, come back here in 10 minutes. <laughs>